Welcome to Exposing the Bible Podcast, where we are teaching the whole counsel of Scripture. We are looking at Romans 1, 24 through 32 that uh, we have as the unrighteous given over by God. So Paul's argument that the Gentiles are unrighteous continues in this passage. And we have to remember that Romans 1, 18 through chapter 3, verse 20 reveals how all people are unrighteous and everyone falls short of the glory of God. As we saw in Romans 1, 21 through 23, scripture is clear. The Gentiles have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. Failure to give God glory is the root of sin, and now we see what the outflow of this rejection leads to. God giving people over to their sins. In these verses, we read that God gave them up three times. And the word for gave them up is not passive. It's active, which reveals God actively gives people over to their sin. He is active in this process. So rejecting God as the sovereign creator is a personal rejection of God, and he responds with active, personal, just judgment. Romans 1, 24 through 32 can be broken up into two sections. 24 through 27, we plainly see that homosexuality is unnatural. 28 through 32, Paul lists out a host of sins they were given over to in their rejection of God. And so the main theme here is the unrighteous are given over to their sin by God himself. And so let's first turn to these first four verses where we will see God giving people over to sexual sin. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And so it's easy to take these verses as their own passage. But we must keep in mind the previous verses that come before this. The word therefore in verse 24 is a connector between Romans 1, 22 through 23. So we can't simply start at Romans 1, 24 and take off. We have to back up just a little bit to understand how we can actually move forward. Romans 1, 21 through 23 tells how people thought they were wise, but they were really fools. Why? because the Gentiles have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. And so now Paul is going to give a very real example of how this happens. And so we see that God gave them up. Again, this is active. The wording gave them over, gave them up, was often used in a judicial context. Paul's point is God is a just judge who gives people the just judgment that they deserve. This is a personal giving over to judgment. It is not abstract. It's not impersonal. Humanity willingly rejected God, and as a, re- God, as a result, God reveals his wrath by personally, not impersonally, handing them over to the dishonoring of their bodies. Our God is not a deistic God. He did not create the universe and then sit back to see what happens. He is personally active in every single person's life. Obviously, we think about that in our own lives, but this also includes those who are not of God. He is personally active in their lives. And here we see that he actively and personally gives them up over to their sin. And now the focus becomes even more narrow on how God gave them up. He actively gives them up to the lust of their hearts to impurity. First, we see God gave them over to what was already in their hearts. Lust or desires are not inherently evil, but in this context, it certainly is. 
The sexual desire, which we shall see what that is specifically referring to in the following verses, that the Gentiles lusted after was forbidden by God, and it was also unrighteous. And second, what did this desire lead to? Impurity or uncleanness, specifically unnatural sexual immorality as an idol. They worshipped this type of sexual immorality. And now we come to the end of verse 24, which answers the question, why did God give them up to the impurity? So they could dishonor their bodies among themselves. This means that they lacked respect for God's created order. God's creation for sexual intimacy is clearly revealed in Genesis chapter 1. However, the Gentiles have rejected this entirely and have engaged in sexual idolatry, which has led them to sexual license. It doesn't matter. We can sexually act however we want to. All is okay. And remember, this giving up was an act of God. It was by him that this happens. God does not simply retain people who reject his lordship. So he gives them over to the desires of their hearts, and he removes the restraints for the natural sexual order. This is a divine, punitive act by God, but it is not spiteful, nor is it vengeful. God, in his gracious goodness, gives his creation over to their animalistic desires if they reject or suppress him. But why does this all happen? Why does God give up the Gentiles to the lusts of their hearts in a judicial manner? Because they have exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. And if you jump back up to Romans 1, 22 and 23, you see it's almost similar. But here in this verse, it's actually a stronger restatement of 22 and 23. At the core of their unnatural sexual beliefs was a lack of understanding about the truth of God. Romans 1.20 already spoke about this truth. They have rejected the creator that they can plainly know. They do not honor or give thanks to him. Once again, the root of idolatry rests on a total failure to give God glory. And so what was the result of this rejection and suppression? These people worship and serve the creatures and the creature rather than the creator. God demands exclusive worship from his, pe- from his people. They are not to worship any other God or any other idol. Our God is a jealous God, as Exodus 25 and 6 states. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, referring to other gods. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Yet, God also demands worship from everyone. Every person he has created, he will get worship from one day. And we know this from Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, And bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? To the glory of God the Father. These Gentiles individuals have not worshiped God. Instead, they have traded the glory of the immortal God and worship rather the creature. A terrible idolatry is afoot. And yet Paul ends this verse not negatively, but with a doxology. The scriptures point to the glory of God regardless of the failure of Gentiles to worship him by their unnatural sexual acts. Regardless of the sexual beliefs of culture, Paul praises the one true creator. So Paul removes himself from cultural belief by rooting his worship, not in the creature, but the creator, a wonderful doxology in the midst of sexual perversion. And now in verses 26 and 27, Paul specifically identifies the sexual uncleanness God gave people up to in verses 24 and 25. They have exchanged heterosexual monogamous relations in the created order for homosexuality. And that is the example Paul uses 
for how people exchange the glory of the immortal God for human idolatry. Now again, God personally and actively gives them over to this behavior. As these verses reveal, homosexual acts, whether committed by women or men, are unnatural and unclean. These individuals are given to unnatural desires and behaviors regarding sexuality, which is the due penalty for their error. And yet, in our culture today, these four verses are highly controversial. But these verses were also highly controversial in Paul's time. Lesbianism was looked negatively at in this culture. However, male homosexuality was looked upon more positively. These verses are just as countercultural in Paul's day as they are in our day. So we must remember, Paul is using homosexual acts as an example of God's rejecting God and his created order. And to have a proper view of biblical sexuality, we must travel all the way back to the beginning. Genesis 1, 26-28. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In God's creation, we see the natural created order for sexuality between one man and one woman who are married. These verses, often referred to as the Edina Covenant, tell of the role that humanity was supposed to fill in Eden. Three commands start verse 28. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Reproduction was a central aspect of the covenant in Eden. Adam and Eve were supposed to enjoy one another in sexual intimacy, which would produce offspring. God's good design was for marriage to be the place for covenantal lifelong fellowship between one man and one woman. Marriage also included a sexual element for intimacy and reproduction. Reproduction is obviously only capable between a man and a woman. This is why Paul can outrightly state that homosexuality is unnatural. Homosexuality goes against God's design to be fruitful, against God's design to multiply, and against God's design to fill the earth. Thus, homosexuality is a complete rejection of God's created order and God's design in Genesis chapter 1. Second, homosexuality is also a sign of a culture that has turned against God. However, as we have learned from this passage, it is also a sign of God personally giving both individuals and a society over to their sins. This is not God pulling back from society. No, in fact, it's quite the opposite. Society runs from God, and he personally and punitively gives them over to homosexuality. So it is between culture and God's word that we find ourselves. And have we ever felt the pull to lessen homosexuality because we personally know someone living this lifestyle? Do we truly see that this is God giving people and society over to grotesque sin? One of the biggest reasons Christians change their view on homosexuality is because they know someone personally who is living a homosexual lifestyle. And I'm sure we in this room are all too well familiar with those situations personally, or we know a friend or family member that is having this happen. And so in light of this, I want us to take a deeper step into our dealings with the homosexual agenda. First, scripture is clear. Homosexuality does go against the created order in Genesis 1. And Paul clearly and plainly writes about that. Paul does not condone this type of sexuality at all. Yet Paul is not a downer on sexuality. No, in fact, he writes about sexuality elsewhere. In 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5, he makes it clear that men and women should not give up their conjugal rights within marriage in any way, shape, or form, unless it's agreed upon by both of them. And so Paul does not look down upon sexuality. In fact, he says it is good both physically and spiritually for marriage. 
And so as that passage makes clear, God designed marriage for the expression of sexuality, both in a physical manner and a spiritual manner. So Paul's argument itself squarely is against the reality that homosexuality is clearly unnatural in created order, and it is very clearly unbiblical. Second, we need to see homosexuality beyond the simple behavior. All too often, our conversations regarding homosexuality are just that, surface level dealing with the behavior. Yes, they are certainly living in sin, but there is so much more to it than simply living in sin. They have rejected the God who can be known. And as such, God is personally and punitively giving them over to their sin. So the wrath of God is being applied to both the individual and then for societies that accept homosexuality, he is now giving it over to the entire society. This allows us to see the spiritual component behind the sinful behavior. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11 says, Now we know that the law is good if anyone uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Paul here gives a list of sins that are contrary to sound or healthy doctrine. And what was one of them? Homosexuality. An acceptance of homosexuality promotes unhealthy doctrine within the church. And it should be rooted out. So let us not simply see homosexuality as a quote-unquote behavior issue, but let us see into the spiritual realm where God is actively giving these people up to their sin as they actively rebel against him. And any church that has accepted this is a church that God has actively given them over to. So let us pray that their active rebellion against God turns instead to a zealous obedience to God from their hearts. And now as we turn to the second section, verses 28 through 32, we're going to see God giving people up to a debased mind and ultimately what that encompasses. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner and unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And so our first question when we look at verse 28 is simply, who is the they? An understanding of they will largely influence your interpretation of these verses. Is, this, is the they referring to the homosexuals in Romans 1, 24 through 27, or is the they speaking to all Gentiles in verse 21? And so depending on how you take that they, will then determine how you apply and interpret these verses. I believe it is best to view the they as all Gentiles who reject God in connection with Romans 1, 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. And there's a lot of connections with verse 21 down into verse 28. And so as we go through this passage, it's not simply saying when you get down to verse 32 that if you practice homosexuality and approve of homosexuality, you deserve death. It's if you practice these things, these sins and then affirm and approve these sins, you deserve death. And so as Romans 1, 18 through 21 states, all Gentiles knew about God and they failed to glorify him. Now Paul restates that truth. They did not see fit to acknowledge God. All Gentiles who have an understanding of God's 
eternal power and divine nature, which is all of them, do not seem fit to acknowledge God and suppress the truth about him. These individuals have examined or tested the reality of God, but ultimately they reject him. In essence, they consider God absolutely unnecessary to live their lives. They simply believe that they do not need him. And since they have come to this conclusion, God's response is, I will give you up to a debased mind. Ironically, those who have examined God and rejected him are then given over to a mind that is debased and worthless, unable to then discern the will of God. And so in their mind, they've rejected God, and God says, fine, then I will corrupt your mind. God truly gives people over to their sins. As a result of God giving them to a worthless mind, they do what ought not be done. Again, this does not simply mean homosexual behavior, although it certainly includes it. It includes all type of sinful behavior. What ought not be done then? Humanity not giving glory to the immortal God. This is what they've done. They have gone back to Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and instead of worshiping the creator of that, they've worshiped all the things that they were supposed to have dominion over. And so instead of living a life to worship and honor God, these Gentiles exist to worship idolatrous images and the creator or the creators in creation. Paul next gives an extensive list of sins in verses 29 through 31. Now, it could be easy for us to look at all about 20 of these and add them up individually, but that would be missing the point. These can be broken down into three primary sections. First, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. These four words describe the wickedness of humanity. And it's important to note what that first one is, unrighteousness. This intentionally draws us back to Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth of God. And so unrighteousness is the driving factor in these first lists. And it is meant to be a reminder that the Gentiles have rejected God as creator and they as his creatures. The list that follows this is a reminder of what characterizes humanity who they forget or when they forget that they are truly gods. Those who reject God at their core are unrighteous, evil, greedy, and malicious. These words reveal the absolute wicked heart of humanity apart from Christ Jesus. The second section of this list reveals sinful Gentiles are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and maliciousness. This section reveals that the Gentiles are not just unrighteous and wicked, which we see in the first section, but they are also full of unrighteousness and wickedness. So their identity is not simply unrighteous, but they are actually full of unrighteousness. The hearts of those who have rejected God are absolutely full of wickedness. And sadly, these same characteristics can be seen in people today who do not see fit to acknowledge God. Finally, the list closes with 12 characteristics of the sinful Gentiles. They gossip and slander, which is whispering or outright um, promoting lies about others. And then the following six sins express the depths of sin. They're haters of God, they're insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, and they're disobedient to parents. And as a group, they don't need to be separated because they all point to the depths of the sinful heart. And then lastly, we see that they are foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. And the, theology, or the theologian Dunn writes, these are senseless, faithless, loveless, and merciless. And as you read these characteristics and you read the list of 20 of those, the weight of the list is great. The depths of depravity in the Gentiles is overwhelming. Paul ensures that no Gentile escapes the reality that they are by nature set against God and his wrath pours out on them as they reject his righteous decree. 
Though the weight of the list is great, the greatest weight actually falls in verse 32. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now here it is why to note correctly who the they are. If we believe that they refers to those engaging in homosexuality, then the application of verse 32 is only for those who approve and practice homosexuality. However, as I stated earlier, I believe they refers to all unrighteous Gentiles. Thus, anyone who approves or practices any part of Romans 1, 24 through 31 deserve to die. To me, the issue is not simply limited to homosexual behavior, although Paul certainly speaks against homosexual behavior, but it is all the sins that Paul mentions in this passage. With this stated, the other question we must ask is, what then is God's righteous decree? We have to go back again. Romans 1, 21 through 23, we see what? They knew God, and they rejected him. So all people even with the lack of special revelation, which are the teachings given exclusively in Scripture, know about God and his judgment. They know this because of general revelation, which can be clearly seen via his creation. Again, Scripture is very clear. All the Gentiles knew God. However, they rejected him and glorified mere images. And what was the result of denying God's righteous decree? Death for those who approve sin and those who practice sin. Eternal death awaits those Gentiles who approve the sin and who practice the sin. But another question is why do those who approve the sin face the same consequence as those who then practice it? Well, it's one thing to commit a sin in a moment of passion, being absolutely overtaken by it. It's another thing, and a most damnable thing, to encourage others to commit those sins. The Gentiles did not have the Sinai covenant, yet God still hold them, held them responsible for sin. And though they did not have the Sinai covenant, there was still enough evidence given by God in creation to reveal he disproved of their sin, and they knew it. Regardless of that, they still just worked to work their way into the disapproval of God, regardless of general revelation. This vice list that we went through is absolutely overwhelming. You can feel the weight of it as Paul writes this all down. These scriptures reveal the totality of sin, depravity, and rebellion of the Gentiles. Though they knew God, they rejected him. And as a result, he gave them up to a debased mind a mind that was a prison. Their minds are given over to corruption, and as a result, they cannot be righteous, and they cannot do righteous deeds. Their minds are held captive by sin because God has actively given them over to their desires. As Joel Beakey writes, the Puritans taught that the conscience functions as a spiritual nervous system, which uses guilt to inform us that something is wrong and needs correction. Failing to heed the warnings of conscience can lead only to the hardening or searing of the conscience, which in the end will bring us to destruction. Sibs compared the authority of the conscience to a divine court within the human soul, where it serves as a witness, accuser, judge, and executioner. And so the Gentiles had their conscience, which was given to them by God. Yet they were sin-laden, and they rejected God entirely. They knew their sins were abominable to God, yet they continued in his disapproval. And the third section of this list proves just how far their rejection went. Just listen to the list once more. We will be able to see how depraved they truly were. They were gossip and slanderers. They falsely spoke privately or publicly about others. They were haters of God, which was an active thing. They were insolent or violent. They were haughty or arrogant and proud, boastful. They were braggadocious and self-centered. They were inventors of evil and in doing so showed creativity in performing evil. 
They were disobedient to parents, which is sin that creates destruction within the home. They were foolish or void of understanding. They were faithless, which meant they were covenant breakers. They were heartless, which means they lacked compassion for others. And then they were ruthless, meaning they were unmerciful. Aren't the Gentiles the same way today? These specific sins are clearly seen in our society, in our culture. Nothing changed from Adam to Noah. Nothing changed from Noah to Christ. And certainly culture did not change from Christ to when Paul wrote this epistle. He is clear in Romans 3.23, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so with that in mind, I'm going to read the slints once again. But this time, instead of thinking of the unrighteous Gentiles, ask the Spirit to draw out where you are. Are you a gossip or a slanderer, speaking falsely about others privately or publicly? You're probably not a hater of God, but are you at odds of God somewhere and actively? Are you prone to violence? Are you prone to being haughty, arrogant, and proud? Are you prone to being boastful, which is being braggadocious and self-centered? Are you, do you show creativity in your sin? You may not be disobedient to your parents because you may not live with them, but do you create dysfunction and destruction within your family relationships? Are you foolish or void of true understanding? Are you faithless, breaking the covenant, the new covenant over and over again? Are you heartless by showing lack of compassion for others? Or are you ruthless in having a heart that is unmerciful? As we have learned, the root of sin is a failure to glorify God. Yet I also think this reveals how in our flesh we are faithless. We don't live to fully, we don't live fully as the Spirit desires us to live. And don't we daily sin against God even with special revelation? And don't we feel the wandering of our hearts running from God? Our faith cannot be in ourselves. As the hymn, Come Thou Found states, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Isn't this our struggle? Aren't we prone to wander? We all have various reasons for why we wander, but don't you feel the inner struggle, the inner struggle of wandering from God? Our faith in our salvific process cannot be founded in ourselves. It must be be founded in the Lord Jesus Christ. So as I read that list, maybe the Spirit convicted your heart of something. You are wandering from God in some way. You've proven yourself to be faithless. Now what? 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13 states, The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. But if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Did you catch that last part? If we are faithless, he remains faithful. God will always, always, always remain faithful to his covenant and the promises found in his covenant. And so maybe you find yourself in a season of faithlessness. You haven't denied God, but you're dealing with issues of faithlessness. You've given over, you've given yourself over to sin again and again and again. The promise here is that God will remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. He will not revoke the eternal covenant he made with you when you became his. It is impossible for that to occur. So as we look at that list of sins and feel the conviction of the Spirit, we can simultaneously be encouraged because God will not deny his own faithfulness despite our faithlessness. So we confess and we're encouraged. And as we close, we must be on constant guard to never approve unrighteousness and wicked living. If we do, we must seriously check our hearts. Scripture is clear that even to affirm any of the sins in Romans 1, 24 through 24 through 31 is spiritually 
dangerous, and it leads to eternal death. And so let our hearts constantly be before the throne where he will help us to see his righteousness, unlike the righteousness of the world. And so we should never approve or affirm that list of sins in any way, shape, or form. Because if we do, God will give us over to a debased mind, and not just ourselves, but ultimately the churches.